Our next speaker is Jen Krejcik, who manages the Oregon Hatchery Research Center located in Alsea, Oregon. She's going to tell us about the facility, what it's like to culture salmon, the different research questions she and her staff are working to answer using cultured salmon. And so Jen, you may now, you may now go ahead and share your screen, turn on your video and begin your presentation. Awesome, thank you. Um, so I'm Jen Krejcik and I'm the manager of the Oregon Hatchery Research Center. We're out in Oregon about 45 minutes from the coast, um, about an hour from Oregon State University. Um, and we're a facility that's run by Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, along with Oregon State a little bit. Um, so what I'm going to do is kind of run through uh, some of the things that we have at the facility. Um, I can give you a little bit of background on, on me and how I got here, um, how my staff got here, and then the projects that we are involved in right now. Um, so the facility used to be a production hatchery. It opened in 1952 and they raised coho, fall chinook, rainbow trout, winter steelhead, and then released the coho and winter steelhead into the creek that the hatchery is on. It was previously called Fall Creek Hatchery because Fall Creek is, is what runs behind the building. Um, in 2004, the ODFW decided that they needed to put in a, um, a research facility so that we could do some research into how we raised fish and do that in-house. Um, and so they wanted to build a facility around that time, coastal coho, uh, wild coastal coho were Endangered Species Act listed. And so they shut the facility down so that it no longer released coho into the creek. Uh, so this became a perfect place to put that facility. Uh, they finished construction in 2005. It cost $7.84 million to make the facility. Basically, they took the old fish hatchery, tore it to the ground for the most part. There's, uh, I think, two original buildings here still, um, and then rebuilt this, this research facility on top of it. And it was paid for by for a variety of different uh, groups around the state. They started research in 2006, and then Day to day, our funding comes from fishing licenses. Um, so when you buy a license to go fish, you help support some of the research that we do. Um, so I'm the manager. I've been with ODFW for eight years. Um, before that, I had uh, attended Florida Institute of Technology. We had a bachelor's of science there. Um, graduated in 2009 and could not find a job in the field. So I returned to graduate school, got a master's degree. Uh, really learned in my master's degree that writing is not for me, um, but field work is. So when I got the opportunity to work for uh, ODFW, using my hands, doing that field work um, kind of stuff every day, uh, that was great. And then when I found out, because I didn't know at the time, um, that there was a research center. I was really excited um, because that kind of tied the two, you know, my education to, um, you know, working with my hands kind of a passion. Um, I have two staff members, a senior technician whose name is Craig Lawson. He came to us um, from the University of Southern Mississippi. He also has a master's degree and his job in Southern Mississippi was working on systems design for recirculating aquaculture. Um, so he was raising spotted sea trout and triple tail um, and building all of the, the tanks and systems and, and maintaining all of that for those types of, of warm water fish. Um, and then I guess it's been about six weeks ago, we hired Brian He's got several years of experience um, with Idaho Fish and Game, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, and Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, raising multiple species of salmon and trout. Um, so he's been a really good asset for us as well. Um, he also has a bachelor's degree. Um, 
none of that is required to work for ODFW. To work for ODFW, you can, um, you can simply uh, work a temporary position six months out of the year for three years for a total of 18 months of temporary experience. Um, or you can go to Mount Hood Community College and get a, uh, and that's in Portland, Oregon, get um, a fishery science degree, which is a two-year associate's degree that works pretty much hand in hand with ODFW. You end up um, spending at least one day a week at a hatchery to get practical experience. Um, I'm not sure if you have to do that for just one year or two of, of the two-year program there. There's also a community college on the Oregon coast, Oregon Coast Community College. They have a um, aquarium science program, but we do have some ODFW employees that have graduated from there. Um, so really, if you can get some fish experience somewhere, you can get on at ODFW. So some of the things that our facility has, and I'll try and run through this so we have time. Um, we have various sizes of tanks, depending on what your research needs are, you may want a bigger tank or a smaller tank, uh, bigger fish, smaller fish, more fish, less fish. Um, so we have 12 foot tanks, six foot tanks, four foot tanks, three foot tanks outside. We have troughs inside. We have two water sources. We have Fall Creek, which is our main water source for all of the tanks that are outside. And then up in the top right corner, the, the photo there is Carnes Creek. There's only enough water in Carnes Creek to use it um, in the winter and spring. And so we use that inside. It's cleaner um, for incubation, so we don't have as much sediment on our eggs. Um, we have dedicated lab spaces. Like I said, they, they started over from scratch with, uh, with the facility. And so we had, um, it, instead of having space that they, they modified into lab spaces, they just built labs. So in the top right, we have a dry lab. Bottom left there, we have um, a wet lab. Everything in the wet lab, those, those uh, tanks that you see there, those can come in or out depending on if they're needed or not. And up in the ceiling, we have all of our water is up in the ceiling um, in that building. We can heat it, we can cool it, we can leave it the temperature it is outside. Um, so you have a lot of options when you come to do research in our facility. This is the water process room where we heat and chill the water. Um, we also have four simulated streams, which are basically big raceways, but they um, are filled with gravel. And so we can put fish in the streams and they basically, as far as they are concerned, they live in a wild stream. Uh, we don't feed the fish there. Water flows from top to bottom. There's woody debris. Um, we put them in there, see who survives. Um, so that's always kind of fun when that runs. We also have an electromagnetic tower. Uh, some of the research we've done has looked at how fish navigate in the ocean. And so they use magnetite um, to orient to the magnetic field of the earth. And so this electromagnetic tower allows us to create um, a magnetic field for any place that we want. And so you can use that, and, and they did, to show that the fish can sense it and that they know where they should be and that they know where they, uh, where they are and they can adjust where they, their orientation to try to aim towards where they should be. We also have a large meeting space. Um, we have meetings in here, we have classes. Um, when we aren't uh, under restrictions from COVID, we have students here um, quite often this time of year, we do spawning uh, classes, we do dissection classes, and this is the room that we uh, run most of that out of. We have a small conference room um, upstairs in our facility because it's a two-story facility. We have 24 dorm rooms 
and a full kitchen. So if somebody wanted to do research and they were coming from out of state or out of town, they can stay. Um, so some of the things that we've done in the past, we already touched on, on how salmon are navigating in the ocean. Um, the mechanism at play was being looked at a couple of years ago and was published last year or early this year um, that it is magnetite. They looked at whether changing water temperature during incubation changes the ratio of males to females. And this is important because you have particularly at our facility with the ability to change the water temperature um, really any way we want. Um, if, we, if we slow down development by cooling the water off, are we actually um, changing, changing the ratio of males or females? And so that could be important. Um, your, your future, generations are, are determined by the number of females. The more females you have, the more fish you could potentially have. Uh, males can spawn multiple times. Females only have as many eggs as they have. Um, we looked at whether you could triploid summer steelhead. Yes, you can. They do not, however, survive entering saltwater. And those that do survive entering saltwater do not return. Um, and so you can do it, but there's no benefit to doing it. Um, the hope was that you could, uh, and, and when we say triploid, we're adding an extra copy of genes to eat these fish, which renders them sterile. So the idea would be, can we put sterile fish out that aren't going to ever spawn with a wild fish and still have a fishery on them? If they don't come back and or if they don't survive when they get out to salt water, then no, that, that defeats the purpose. Um, we've looked at uh, whether or not the way that you collect your broodstock matters. So if you want to fish for something and you use a fish that avoided being caught by a fisherman and made it to a fish hatchery trap, um, are their offspring less likely to be caught because they know how to avoid being caught. Um, this also came out recently and it, uh, it does not make a difference. Um, trap caught broodstock create more fish um, either back to the trap or caught by anglers. So the, the question becomes less, does it matter how you collect them um, for what their genetics are and more? Um, there's a lot less stress when a fish swims into a trap and then is handled and then um, goes from there as opposed to being, you know, angled, brought to the boat, put in a live well, transported by truck to uh, the hatchery. Uh, and that stress leads to more broodstock dying and potentially uh, a lower quality of egg. Um, so trap caught broodstock are not less likely to be caught by anglers. They're not necessarily more likely either. There's just going to be more fish available. Um, we had a master's project that was looking at how fish navigate around the guidance booms and reservoirs. So reservoirs would have a dam at the... Uh, downstream end of them. And salmon being anadromous and wanting to go to the ocean and leave fresh water. Um, if they're up above that dam, they need to get past it on their way back down. And so one of the ways that they kind of direct them to juvenile um, transport areas is using guidance booms. So this project looked at the angle and the depth that was most effective. Um, we've looked at structures. I have a photo of that coming up um, and how that affects stress levels during rearing. Recently, we looked at that as a, as a facility staff to see if, you know, it does reduce stress levels, but what does that really mean from a fish culture perspective? 
does that mean um, they don't get sick as much? Does that mean that they, they eat better? Does that mean they grow better? Um, so kind of the, you know, it's great that their stress levels are, are, are less under, under structure, but does that actually mean anything um, on the day-to-day -day level? So currently we're working with the surrogate program. These are structures on the left. Um, they design or, or grow fish for the Army Corps of Engineers. They're trying to make fish uh, in a hatchery that are more wildlike to use in studies through those juvenile transports at the, at the dams. Um, ODFW won't let you go out and catch 2,000 fish that are wild spawned, and the chances that you're going to catch those are pretty low anyways. Um, so we have a program where we take the um, fish spawned from wild parents, we raise them at low densities with structure and give them special food. And then they do, uh, they do look a little different than a hatchery fish. And they also behave a little differently. So then the Army Corps comes in and takes those and uses those. Um, this is a salmon mate choice project. So uh, in salmon, the female gets to choose which male she wants to um, fertilize her eggs. So the, the question becomes, you know, in hatcheries, we, we just randomly pick up a fish and we say, okay, we're spawning this female to that male. Um, but we have a project that has been looking, um, looking through uh, the pedigree, the genetics of successful wild mates um, and seeing what, what the female was looking for and then they're looking to create a real quick way to identify those in the field so that you could take a female and you could, you could tag her, take her genetics and say, well, based on her genetics, this is what the male needs to have. You could take genetics of the males and say, okay, this one should spawn with her because he's compatible. Um, so we want to know if that will increase our reproductive success. Um, if we spawn that way. And that project is ongoing at a production hatchery. They're in their second spawning season this, uh, this month. We've also been looking at whether hatchery rearing practice is contributing to reduced reproductive success. And, and reproductive success basically is just saying um, hatchery fish when they return if they were to spawn in the wild, they would have lower offspring numbers um, than a wild pair spawning in the wild. And so this is how you determine if, if the fish population is fit. Um, so the genetic fitness is saying that um, there's been a lot of domestication in hatcheries and that the fish are less fit because they're not as successful at spawning in the wild, which to be honest, we don't want them to do anyways. Um, and so they've been looking at things like density or how we feed or how many days they get fed and how much they get fed to see if any of those things has anything to do with, with the, the rate of domestication. Um, and then one of the more interesting ones, uh, in my opinion, just because I got to be involved in building a lot of this and, and uh, making sure that it worked, is the olfactory imprinting project. So basically here we had a hatchery that's not getting very many fish back to their hatchery. Um, and so they, they're trying to add an odor to the water. Um, above is a Y maze, so you put 10 fish in each of the bigger boxes, put an odor on the left-hand side or the right-hand side of each of those long arms, um, put regular water on the other side, open the gate, let them swim around, and in an hour see where they are. Did, did they prefer one odor to the other? And so they did that for 20 odors and about 7,000 fish. And then they brought them 
different fish, same odors down into the, the photo on the bottom. Um, and this was a learning apparatus. So you put a one fish in each bucket. Um, it's just got water flowing in it. Then there was a way for the researcher to add that particular odor. Once she added the odor, she would add some food via a, a tube to a ring. And now the question is, can you teach the fish that when they smell that odor and they get fed? Um, so at the end of the week, if you put that odor in, will they go swim over by the ring? And so that's how they decided which odors the fish could learn um, and which they wanted to uh, utilize at the production hatchery. Uh, this page is not actually that interesting for you guys. Um, we do have a, a mission statement for the facility where we're understanding the differences between wild and hatchery salmon and steelhead so that we can develop approaches to manage those differences, um, to do you know, fishery objectives and conservation objectives. You know, we're not here just for hatchery fish. We're here for wild fish also. Um, and so how do we balance all of those things with what we've learned? Um, and then, you know, since we are in Oregon, we're, we're trying to help Oregonians understand um, the role and, and the performance of hatcheries and, and what we do to support native fish and, and keep the, the um, the fisheries alive as well. And then this is not important. Although we do have a website that you're more than welcome to go to. Um, and it's got a little bit of information there about the research, um, how you would get involved in the research here, um, and some about our uh, education program. And that's what I got. Thank you, Jen. Appreciate yeah. your overview of all the really cool research that's coming out of the facility. Uh, it's yeah. fantastic. Um, and I can bring that back up too. I probably shouldn't have closed it. No, oh, you're great. No worries. So uh, what would be the day, can you describe, I know it would be tough, a day in the life of you as a hatchery manager? Like what would be your, tell these students what it's like to kind of your daily routine? Um, yeah, so today for example, um, we came in, we've got a few things we do every day. We, we feed the fish every day. Um, we take the rain, the water temperature, we clean uh, tanks inside every day. So we start there. Um, we have a, a planning meeting pretty much every day to say, okay, this is where we're going today. Um, particularly on Mondays, uh, we are on call for seven days. So, for example, I'm on call right now, um, so I'm not going anywhere um, until next Monday. Uh, so last week, somebody else was on call over the weekend, and so then the question Monday morning goes, okay, what, what did you get done over the weekend? What is there that we still need to do? Um, so we'll meet up and, and do things like that. Um, right now, we have adult fish coming back. So after we finished feeding the fish today, uh, we went up and worked our trap. So there weren't, I think there were three or four fish in the trap today. Uh, each fish gets handled. Uh, we take um, two genetic samples, an isotope sample from their tail. We take a, a, a punch from their opercular uh, flap on the right side so that we know that we've seen them in case they fall back down the dam and, and come through the ladder again. We take species, uh, sex, so male, female, and length, and then we release them upstream to spawn naturally uh, as, as long as they're wild fish. If it's a hatchery fish, we'll take it out of the system um, so that they can't keep going up. Once we finish that, um, we continued on a project we've been working on for the last uh, week or two, uh, building some stairs. So like Cheryl said, um, our job, same, same deal. You know, you need to be willing to go outside and get your hands dirty um, and work on stuff like that. We had a researcher come out in preparation for the project that they're doing this fall, or I guess winter. Um, and so Craig Spence, um, 
you know, about an hour with them going through what they needed to do to get their project ready and what we needed to have ready for them. Um, and then, yeah, from there we went, uh, well, we came here. And so now I'm doing some, some education and outreach. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's a pretty mixed bag of different things that we do. Sounds like it. And so I know you had mentioned it, um, but yes, in addition to what you had described of the field work and the husbandry, like the taking care of animals, you, you usually are hosting students and doing fish dissections and doing outreach like this. So yeah. a very cool variety. If there's folks out there that are interested in field work and working with animals, but then also working with public or youth um, in terms of outreach, it's a nice mixture you have there, Jen. And, and I, would, I would plug also just Anytime you're working with fish, the the or salmon in particular, the life cycle is a year, um, and so you you really get to follow that kind of a cycle. And this time of year, we have adults. In the summer, we're doing projects, and we don't have adults. Um, you know, we have eggs in the spring, so things change fairly often. So if there's uh, you know, egg work can get kind of boring sometimes, but it's only for a month or two. And then you're on to something different. Um, so there's that positive to it as well is, is it's always changing. Variety. I like it. Yeah. Very good. And so uh, we have a question from Renee about how many fish are usually in the creek? <laughs> if you can <laughs> guesstimate. That is a really great question. Um, <laughs> and it, it really depends. Um, it depends on the species. So we have, uh, we have Chinook right now, and this year has been the best Chinook year we have ever, ever had, um, since OHRC has been here. So in the last um, 10 years, um, we are at, I think 400 Chinook back. Our previous best was 161. Um, so wow. this is by far the best Chinook run I've ever seen here. Um, there have been years, the first two years, so I've been at this facility for four uh, adult seasons. The first two seasons I was here, we didn't even break 300 fish for the whole six or seven months that our trap is open. Um, Last year, on the other hand, we had over a thousand fish come back. So it, it really depends on the year. It depends on what the water is doing. It depends on what the ocean is doing. Um, I don't know, to be honest, if, if we're going to get a really good coho run. We had a great coho run last year, and we've had like 20 back this year or something so far. And usually we have a few now. Um, then again, they don't usually peak for a couple more weeks, but the Chinook came back really early this year. So I'm not, it's hard to say exactly how many, but some somewhere around 500 probably. Three, wow. three to 500 would be our average year. Well, it's pretty cool to kind of take the numbers that are coming back and then because they're so varied to kind of use those physical parameters like you're talking about water temperature, all these different parameters to figure out what's going on. Very cool. I hope yeah. everyone's okay with me squeezing in a few more questions. These are really good questions we have. Um, so thanks for sticking it out with us. Um, we have a question from Vera. So you talked about the temperature, uh, the importance of temperature with salmon. And so is there, if the earth is warming, what does that mean? Does it mean that we'll have more males? So as I recall from my glancing at that uh, paper, it didn't make a difference. There are some species that, that it does. So some species of fish, sex is temperature dependent, but for salmon, they didn't find that. Um, so as far as our salmon go, it's maybe not such a big deal as far as, as the, the sex ratio is concerned. Um, there is, or there, there's a group of ODFW researchers that are specifically looking at temperature and respiration and how rising temperature is going to affect the various native species of Oregon. Um, Cause our, our fish are cold water fish. And um, the warmer your water gets, the less oxygen there is and the less 
um, happy they'll be. Right. I don't know if I answered that well or not, but. That was good. It's an attempt. Good job. All right, so really quick, two more. These are gonna be quick ones. So two more and then we'll wrap up for the day. Um, have you had any bald eagles or other wildlife take salmon from out of the side of your tanks? Yes. <laughs> yes, we have. Uh, right outside my office, uh, there are two raceways of display fish. And there's, there's rainbow trout in there that are five or six years old. Um, and they're two or three feet long. And at least once we've had a, a bald eagle line it up just right and just come right into that, that raceway and just pick off one of those big rainbow right outside the, the office window. Oh my goodness. We actually had a meeting this morning with a chain link company um, looking at redoing some bird netting in chain link because uh, in the last year we've had coyote, bear, cougars, uh, we have bald eagles, otters, mink, beaver, um, all around our facility in the last year. So they're all they're all here. They know they know where to go. Um, blue herons are a big issue. Oh, okay. Um, kingfishers can be a, a smaller problem, and um, American dippers are an issue at, at hatcheries because they're small enough to get into the little fry. Gotcha. Um, but yeah. Bird okay. Not things. surprised by that answer at all. No. Must be an interesting management component. Uh, on yeah. Your we, we, we laugh and we say, well, there's a fish and there's a deer on our, on our uh, logo. We are fish and wildlife. So <laughs> yes. This is how we support the wildlife side of that. Good point. Good point. And then last but not least, we have a question from Jeremiah. Jeremiah excuse me. What's the biggest species of salmon you've held? Uh, a Chinook. Chinook salmon. Do you know about the size? Uh, you can just put your hands up and show us. <laughs> the biggest, so the biggest one I've seen in our trap this year was 105 centimeters, which is about 42 inches. Um, and I didn't handle him. Craig had him. Um, I've had a 96 centimeter one. So that's, uh, what, like 37 inch fish this year. Um, I, when I first started, I worked at Bonneville Dam. There's a hatchery out there and they get something called a Thule Chinook. And uh, Chinook come in all these different shapes. It's kind of weird depending on where you are. Uh, but Thule are really deep and big. Um, so 30 to 40 pounders may be up there if, you're, if you get a good one. Um, and their tails, like I, I don't have huge hands. Their tails are, are hard for, for me to grip. Um, you know, so they're a good six inches across the back of the base of the tail. Um, and uh, yeah, there's some, there's some big fish. I've just kind of bear hugged them to try not to drop them on the floor at times. Um, but I didn't get sizes on those. We just, we just released them without measuring them. Um, but yeah, Chinook are the biggest ones and, and we do get those up here. Gotcha. I can imagine they're a little hard to wrangle when they're it wiggling around like that. It can be. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Jen. Um, and thank you participants for hanging out with us a little longer so we can get some more questions answered by Jen. So thank you, Jen, for your presentation. We really do appreciate it.